Welcome to the People of AI podcast, showcasing inspiring people with interesting stories in the field of artificial intelligence. I'm Ashley Oldacre. Let's jump right in. We are back with season three of People of AI with a lineup of incredible people. During season two, we focused on the big shift in technology spurred on by generative AI. Fast forward 12 months, and with the launch of multimodal models, we are in an interesting point in history. In season three, we will dive deeper into the latest releases in AI from Google, and as always, continue to explore our guests' personal and professional journeys into the field of AI. At the same time, we want to dig deeper into the societal implications of what our guests create. We will ask questions to understand how they are leveraging AI to solve problems and create new experiences and make sure it is used safely and responsibly. If you are joining us for the first time, you can binge listen to our amazing guests from season one and two, wherever you get your podcasts. And we are glad you're here. So let's jump right in with our first guest of season three. This podcast is sponsored by Google. Any remarks made by the speakers are their own and are not endorsed by Google. Hello, hello. Ashley here. I'm thrilled to introduce you to our very special guest today, Adrit Rao. Adrit is a 16-year-old high school student, app developer, and a research intern at Stanford University. For the past three years, his research combines app development and artificial intelligence to build point-of-care, accessible, easy-to-use tools to diagnose and treat health issues like cardiovascular conditions. In addition to co-authoring, publishing, and presenting his research papers at conferences around the world, he most recently won a congressional coding challenge for an app he developed called Signer, which uses computer vision and AI to translate American Sign Language into spoken English. In total, Adrit has developed and launched five iOS apps since he was 12 years old. All of his apps are managed under a nonprofit organization called Aerotech, which he founded in 2020 to teach app development to kids through a program called Learn to Code for Kids. He also serves as the board member of the Get Involved Foundation, where he is developing apps that support community service initiatives. Welcome, Adrit. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, we're so glad that you're here and that you took the time. So you are 16 and you have already like lived multiple lifetimes <laughs> <laughs> within your 16 years. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, tell us your story, you know, however far back you want to take us. Yeah, so my journey into programming started when I was eight years old, and I was introduced to block programming, uh, Scratch to be specific, in elementary school. And I still remember being so excited and so engaged in it because I could put some blocks together and see my code come to life. And I used to develop games, and during lunchtime, I used to sit with my friends and just program using those blocks, and I found it very fun. And so that was my first introduction to the world of programming. And this this was like provided by your school. This was something you like learned in school or something uh, you did like briefly, on the side? It was briefly introduced. So our teacher just told us that it's available and if you want, you can use it. So lots of us started to use it. Wow, cool. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And, and so as I transitioned to more traditional programming languages, I realized that I didn't have the same level of interest because I couldn't really see my code come to life. And so that was kind of a point in which my coding journey stopped temporarily but during the COVID-19 pandemic, during the quarantine period, I had a lot of free time and decided to give coding another shot. But this time I wanted it to, to be uh, more engaging, more fun, and I wanted to do something which could someday have an impact. And that's when I thought of apps on the App Store. And I've always been so amazed by apps and how uh, you can distribute it to so many people through the App Store. And uh, the accessibility aspect of it was really interesting to me. And at the same time, I thought that I could feel that same excitement of writing code and then seeing something come to life. So I decided to self-learn app development using YouTube videos and courses online. And it started off very slow. I was just developing very simple apps like a calculator, for example. But it slowly progressed and it was really exciting to see my code come to life again. And I always wanted to have an app on the App Store. And so I was kind of working towards that goal. And... Just around two to three weeks into my app development journey, Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference was uh, coming around the corner. And every year they have a challenge for students called the Swift Student Challenge. 
And you basically develop an app and submit it. And they choose 350 kids from around the world to attend the conference on scholarship. And so I decided to give it a chance and test my luck. And so I developed an app in the next two weeks after that. And to my surprise, I was the youngest uh, awardee uh, of the scholarship in 2020. And I had the chance to meet Tim Cook, which was a super exciting experience for me. And I feel like that really motivated me to continue my journey. And then uh, since then, I developed and published five apps on the App Store, which aim to uh, solve various problems in the community. And yeah, my journey into AI started when I was 13. And basically, I came across an article one day talking about how AI was being applied in healthcare. And the article stated that there was an AI model that was developed that was actually able to detect cancer, which was really just amazing to me. And so I started to self-learn AI at that point because I had self-learned app development and I knew that there would be so many resources online and uh, that I could use. So I learned the fundamentals of AI with a focus on healthcare and its applications in healthcare. And my knowledge in app development also came into use because I started to think about AI-based apps and I started to explore that avenue, which was really exciting. And then at 13, I started to intern at uh, Stanford, where I've been applying AI and apps to solve healthcare problems. And it's been an amazing experience to collaborate with so many uh, amazing people at Stanford. And I've been able to learn a lot. And I've had the opportunity to develop apps which have even been in clinical trials, which I think is really exciting. And hopefully someday the research that I'm doing can make a difference. Yeah. Well, I know that we'll be talking about some of your projects, Mm -hmm. but I'd like to sort of come back and understand more of this like intersection between healthcare and app development and AI. And I would love to know, like, why healthcare? Like, why did you take an interest in healthcare versus like sports, for example, or mm-hmm. building an app, you know, for for analyzing sports results or looking into, I don't know, like biology or things mm-hmm. like that? Why specifically, uh, you know, or like the environment? Like, why specifically healthcare? I think personally, it goes back to that article I read and how I just saw that use case to be so impactful. And the fact that it can help save lives was just amazing. And I think app development and AI really come together nicely because it can really make these tools accessible. And that's something that I've really been focusing on in my research at Stanford is making these tools accessible because uh, if AI is distributed through apps, it can reach a lot of people. So I think that that's what made it really appealing to me that not only is it having the potential to solve healthcare problems, but apps have the ability to make these solutions a lot more accessible. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So you started off by, you know, being interested in essentially coding and building apps, which has to do with seeing the results of your code Mm -hmm. in practice. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your AI journey, because I believe on one of your projects, you use TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, TensorFlow is, it's not an impossibly difficult (laughs) framework, Mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it's pretty advanced framework. Mm -hmm. Um, So how did you sort of evolve or get into learning about machine learning? I mean, you know, from that article, Mm -hmm. a lot of folks are like, whoa, machine learning. You know, I mean, now it's become a lot more accessible, but it could have been, you know, a little bit intimidating. How did you sort of ease into the into the AI space? I think for me, it's honestly just been YouTube videos uh, to learn (laughs) all of this. You know, when I started, I knew that it would be a really slow process, but I knew that it would be really exciting. And I think my journey in app development gave me that motivation that I can learn it. I just have to go slowly. But just watching YouTube videos on TensorFlow and frameworks uh, like TensorFlow and being able to write code. I remember I used to develop like image classifiers for cats and dogs uh, from the TensorFlow blogs. And that was really exciting. And again, um, very engaging and visual because I could see my code come to life and um, I could see these machine learning models actually come to life. And the project at Stanford have also been a great learning experience for me because it's working with like real world uh, medical data, which Mm -hmm. is very challenging, but it just requires a lot of iteration. But it's really exciting to see the end product when you've developed that model, which is actually accurate at analyzing the data. I guess most coding, but specifically machine learning is you get these very immediate Mm -hmm. results that you get to analyze and you get to work with. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like 
you sort of started off with videos and then incrementally that led you to blogs and other things. Okay, so when was that moment where you were learning about like image classification and you were like, hey, I can use this to build and address certain issues in healthcare. What mm -hmm. was that sort of moment for you? I think that when I first started uh, and I was introduced to the first problem, which I solved in my first project at Stanford, I was actually learning based on that. So after I was given a problem is when I didn't have all the all the different tools in my toolkit to be able to solve it. But after getting a problem and like iterating through different ideas and after finalizing on an idea I wanted to implement is when I went and learned how I could actually do that. So when it started uh, with my first project, which was analyzing sounds from people's arteries, uh, the first approach I used was actually converting the sound into numbers and then using a machine learning model to analyze those numbers. So I had to actually go and learn about the different ways I could do this type of processing uh, using blogs and videos, for example. But I think after my first project, I was able to pick up like multiple different tools in my AI toolkit. And now I'm able to just use them more comfortably. But when I started, it was mostly learning based on the problem presented to me. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Very neat. So speaking of projects, would you like to tell us about the projects that you're working on currently? Sure. So the current project I'm working on is about abdominal aortic aneurysms. So aortic aneurysms are the bulging of the aorta. Uh, it can be caused by multiple different factors. And it has a high rate of sudden cardiovascular mortality. And currently in the clinic, clinicians will measure the diameter of the aorta in CT scans to be able to figure out whether or not a patient needs to undergo surgery for their aneurysms. But this process is highly subjective and has Why? a lot of variability uh, because it's very manual and there's no objective way to measure an aneurysm. Oh, OK. So the goal of the project is to basically use AI to make this process more objective. And basically, I've trained an algorithm which can look at a CT scan and figure out the size of the aorta automatically by segmenting its location and then measuring it. And currently, it's actually being tested on real clinical data. So I'm really excited about that. That's awesome. You have this other project called Auto ABI. And so a lot of your focus, at least for right now, seems to be focusing a lot on cardiovascular mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. um, so would you like to share a little bit more about what Auto ABI is? Because I feel like that's more of the one of the more advanced projects that you have that's under your belt. Yeah, so Auto ABI was the first project I worked on at Stanford. Dr. Alami introduced me to a problem related to a peripheral artery disease. And peripheral artery disease is basically the blockage of arteries in people's legs that can be caused by various factors such as diabetes. And so the problem with that is that in the clinic, doctors are unable to properly diagnose patients who have diabetes, for example, using traditional methods because people with diabetes have very calcified arteries, which are very compressed. And so it's hard to actually compress those arteries using a blood pressure cuff to be able to figure out whether or not the patient has disease. So the idea was, can we use sound from a patient's artery to determine whether or not they have peripheral artery disease? And this basically can alleviate that limitation of using pressure-based measurements. Okay, so you essentially would listen to the sound of the vessels, sort of the heartbeat mm -hmm. in someone's leg. So what, like, what would a, a healthy heartbeat sound like? Yeah, so a normal artery would sound something like this. And an artery which is clogged would sound something like this. If you look at the waveform of a sound from a normal artery, mm -hmm. you can see it goes up and down more. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at something that is blocked, you can't hear it as well. It's kind of more muffled. And that waveform uh, is also. Okay. And so that's kind of basically what we were analyzing. And so the first thing I did was develop an app which was put into clinics to collect data to actually train the model. So mm -hmm. the app was given to clinicians and they measured whether or not the patient had arterial disease, mm -hmm. and they also recorded the sound from the patient's artery. So over around 
four to five months, we were able to collect a large data set of arterial sounds and the corresponding kind of diagnosis of whether or not the patient had uh, the disease. Oh, wow. Okay. And so that first process really used my app development skills to develop that app. And it was exciting to see that I was getting so much new data, which Mm -hmm. was never like collected before. And then using that, my goal was to create a model which could take new sounds and predict whether or not the patient had disease. Okay. So wait, so you you developed the app first to sort of do the training process, right? To collect collect the data, Mm -hmm. to to record the sounds. Mm -hmm. So that was the first step in your app development. And then the second step was training the model Mm -hmm. and actually then building a model that can then recognize the different sounds and make a prediction based off of the sounds in the leg. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. And so after the training process was very fun, it was very time consuming, but it had multiple different steps to it. Uh, Like I mentioned, I started off by converting the sound into numbers, which was one approach, but that had a very low accuracy. And I think this is very common with developing AI models that you go through many iterations. But I think that process was very exciting. And throughout the process of developing the model, I got to make a lot of great connections at Stanford, uh, especially because I was just starting. It was great to connect with many experts in the field and kind of bounce ideas off of them and be able to gain more knowledge. And so now the final model is not even related to numbers, Mm -hmm. uh, not even related to converting the sound to numbers. It's actually converting the sound to images. So... Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So the sound is converted to spectrograms, which are then analyzed. And so that's a... a what is a spectrogram? Uh, it's basically a visual representation of the sound. Like those waves you were telling kind me of about. Kind like that, yeah. Okay. It shows uh, the amplitude and the waves. Okay. And so then an image classifier actually classifies those images. So it's kind of a two-step process, um, mm, okay. which we didn't think we were going to land on, but yeah. uh, that worked the best. And then after developing that, I put it in a separate app. And now this app, you click a button, it records the audio, and then it runs the the TensorFlow model on your device and predicts whether or not the patient has disease. So it was kind of, it started with an app, it went to developing the algorithm, and then I put it back in an app. Mm -hmm. And so after I developed that app, it was actually, again, put into clinical trials um, where it was tested on a lots of real clinical data in mm-hmm. multiple different clinics at Stanford, and that yielded above a 90% accuracy. So that was wow. super exciting. And oh, that that's was really exciting. over the course of like over a year, around two years. Wow, wow. So where does it stand right now? Yeah, so right now um, it's still being refined using the clinical data, and we're excited for next steps. What are the next steps? Probably filing for a patent, which we're working on now. Okay, and yeah. that would mean then, what would that mean? Uh, after we get a patent, we want to use that to be able to license the technology to bigger companies, which can take it way farther because uh, I think at one institution it's kind of limited. But if we gain the IP for it and we license it to companies such as Philips, for example, mm-hmm. they can take it and they can run it at a national level. That can be the next step. Right, mm-hmm. right. And so when you bring it to the next step, you're no longer testing it. It's actually being put it into use. Uh, It would be tested. I think before it can be FDA cleared, it has to be tested on on lots more data uh, from many different institutions, maybe even globally. So Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be the next step. I just want to be part of that when I grow up. Well, you're already well on your way (laughs) and excited to keep on following your journey. Um, Speaking of sort of AI and healthcare, I wanted to go back to you know, it sounds like the medical field has been sort of one of the forefronts of adapting and using new technology, but with that has also come some risks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the risks I can imagine is, you know, a misdiagnosis Mm -hmm. on the part of the app, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, How are you thinking about about that? Because I think one of the things I'm noticing, especially with generative AI, is it's, it's so easy to sort of fall on the model Mm -hmm. and the predictions Mm -hmm. and believe them to be 100% truth. So Mm -hmm. how are we balancing that or how are you thinking about that? I think that AI and healthcare shouldn't really be to replace clinicians, but it should be to aid them and help them. Uh, So for example, with auto ABI, the goal is for the clinician to use like their traditional methods of um, listening to the circulatory sound and determining if the patient has disease. And the app is only to be used to kind of double check their diagnosis. And I think that with these AI tools, 
it's going to really help make um, make diagnosis more efficient. And it's kind of a tool to kind of double check your diagnosis, hopefully making it more accurate because humans can be subjective and there is error in diagnosis. So mm -hmm. hopefully AI models can help clinicians double check. But I don't think that it should be something that is until it becomes very, very accurate. I don't think at this stage it should be just running on its own without having a human there to supervise it. Right, right, right. And actually, that's a good point, right? I mean, there's human error mm -hmm. as well as machine error. And so hopefully if you combine the exactly. two, then you sort of really eliminate the percentage of error. Mm -hmm. uh, not totally, but you really, really minimize it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that makes sense. So mm -hmm. you're really seeing this as a as a tool mm -hmm. to just continue to enhance the professionals in the field as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm curious how you got into like your journey into Stanford. So did you have this idea for a project and you reached out to a professor uh, and just said, hey, I have this idea. Can I work on this with you? <laughs> or was there sort of like a, an event or an application of sorts? And you're like, hey, let me apply for this program. I'm sure other young students are also interested in learning how they can further research and bring their ideas to life as well. For sure. So after I had kind of went on my own personal journey through app development and AI, uh, I wanted to apply it. And like I said, I was really inspired by how AI was being applied in healthcare. And I guess I just wanted to be a part of that. So, uh, you know, Stanford's really close to home and it's a school that I've really admired over the years for the research that uh, they do. So I basically just looked up professors who are doing things in the space of digital health. And that's when I found Dr. Alami and I contacted him. I sent him an email kind of talking about my journey and what I've done. And um, actually the next day he replied to me and he said that uh, he would love for me to work with him. And that's kind of where oh, that wow. started. Yeah. So, OK, so let's let's get into the nitty gritty details. So you just like you sent him an email saying I'm an app developer. I've developed these apps. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want to work with you. Or did you bring this idea forward? Yeah, so he actually presented me with this idea because okay. he's a vascular surgeon, so okay. he has a lot of um, expertise in that area, and uh, he had this idea before I even contacted him. Oh. But uh, when I started working with him, he then told me, like, can can we develop an AI-based app which can solve this problem? And that's where it started. Okay, so you the strength that you brought was the app development, sort of the mm -hmm. digital aspect of it. And mm -hmm. he brought the expertise in the health. Right. And so you sort of brought your two minds together to create this sort of hybrid solution mm -hmm. yes. in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And he's also the director of digital health at the Bayer Center for Biodescience. Right. So he's also had a lots of other like projects which have gone into clinical trials for digital health. So he has a lot of experience in that area. That is so cool that you just took a risk mm -hmm. and that it paid off. Mm -hmm. And now you're like working on it towards a patent, which is like yeah. very, 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 very exciting. Mm -hmm. Cool. OK, so and just so that we're all clear, like you're doing this in addition to going to school. Yeah. So a lot of these opportunities that you've gotten have been just cold calling, cold emailing <laughs> different people in the industry and just sort of looking for opportunities that takes a lot of courage as well, or or does it? I mean, is this sort of like a skill that you have to build up of just, it sounds like, you know, <laughs> based on what you said, is that you've got a lot of responses back. But I can also imagine that that's not the case always. Yeah, there were lots of people who didn't respond to me uh, throughout my journey, researchers I've reached out to. Um, and I think, you know, it's just important to reach out to people uh, and make connections and Lots of the time they may not reply back, but just taking that step to reach out can really lead to big opportunities. And I think one thing that helped me at a young age was because I was kind of oblivious to like what would happen if they don't reach out or what happens if they reach out. So I would just send emails to people I was interested in collaborating with. And then I've just continued like that throughout the years. Yeah. You know, the fear of rejection is, I mean, it's real mm -hmm. and it, it can sort of be a real hit to the ego. So how do you battle that? Um, I think that like luckily I got an opportunity at a young age. I think that what helped with that was just going on my own personal journey at first and then reaching out with some skills that I had uh, learned on my own. And so that kind of comes back to all the resources online and how people can learn kind of whatever they want, uh, whether it's AI or app development using resources online. And I think building that 
toolkit and then reaching out was what really helped me because Mm -hmm. I actually had something which I could apply to what I was interested in. So I think that just going on your personal journey, going through different ups and downs and just learning from that and then reaching out when you're at a point in which you want to just take your journey to the next level is what helped me. Yeah, well, and I'm starting to also see more the connection of I'm doing something and I get the immediate feedback, which was what was so validating (laughs) with app development. (laughs) And so I'm wondering, I mean, mean, to your point, like if you're building something and you're seeing the fruits and the results of what you are putting effort into, that (laughs) gives you that really positive feedback loop (laughs) and that confidence of like, I built this. (laughs) So there is already this layer base of confidence. (laughs) So why don't I try something else? Why don't I maybe reach out to somebody? And so when you do have those rejections or when things don't necessarily go your way, you have that confidence base to keep pushing you forward. Exactly. And I think app development really gave me that feeling of I can do it, you know, yeah. after being able to develop my first app and then going on to just develop like four more apps that target different problems. It was just, like you said, very validating of uh, what I did. And that's why I think app development is such an amazing skill. And then from app development to AI, again, I could really see what I build and could see it come to life. Right. And the results like right there. Yeah. And I think that's important. I mean, as an adult, I think especially as well as young people, I mean, that's something that a lot of people struggle with, you know, is can this happen? Can I make things happen for myself? And that superpower that you seem to have is very palpable. And it stems from having tried things and built things and seeing the outcomes of them and then just continue to build on top of that. Right. So, very cool. Thank you. OK, so how do you manage your time? So um, I think school is becoming a bit more busy now because I'm in like my final years of high school. But I try to finish my schoolwork like as soon as I come home from school and get it done as soon as possible. Uh, Sometimes I find myself staying up late in the night to work. But I think that because I love it so much, I find the time to do it. And weekends are a great time for me to work on my projects. And I also go to Stanford after school around two times a week. Uh, because it's right across the street. And I get to go there and have a weekly meeting with Dr. Lamy and some of the other people I'm working with. Okay, so school during the day, schoolwork right at home, and then evenings and weekends is when you take the time to build more and think and do more research. And right. So you've also written and co-authored some, some research papers as well. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that process and what is that like and how did you get involved in that? Yeah, so... I guess the two big projects, the main projects which I've been working on is Auto ABI and now the most recent project about aortic aneurysms. But I also love to do research in the general field of medical image analysis. And just starting off as being a researcher and through my research journey so far, I've been reading lots of research articles. And I think that most of the work such as auto-ABI and the aortic aneurysm project, are based on general work done in the field of medical image analysis. So I think the general field of medical image analysis um, really leads to these more specific medical AI developments. So I wanted to be a part of that. So I started doing research uh, related to medical image analysis. And I started just reading a lot of research papers and finding places where I could contribute. And through that experience, I've also been able to collaborate with people outside of Stanford in the industry, Uh, for example, at Adobe and at a company called Lunit. And I've been able to do research like that. And then I've also been publishing papers on the main project, so Auto ABI, and now the most recent uh, project as well. Okay, so it's it's more... When you're researching and you're working on these projects, the findings that you come up with, you then collaboratively with the other people Mm -hmm. on your team, put together a paper to further the research and to share your findings and and the solutions that you found together. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. That's great. So we have covered some of your personal journey and your projects. Are there any other projects that you wanted to talk about before we talk about community? I think outside of Stanford, just for my personal app development journey, yeah. uh, my most recent app on the App Store, Signer, is something right. that I'm really excited about. And so that whole app is based on, um, I found out about how many people are deaf around the world uh, one day, and that statistic really was daunting to me. Mm-hmm. And I did more research and found out about the communication barrier between the deaf and non-deaf communities. 
And I realized that lots of people who are not deaf don't actually understand sign language. And this is a major problem. And so I decided to use my AI and app development skills to develop an app that can convert sign language into speech. And so the goal is to kind of give a voice to people who are deaf or hard of hearing. And basically how it works is that they can perform American Sign Language to the camera and it'll automatically convert it in real time to speech. Wow. So you hold up the camera in Mm -hmm. one of your hands Mm -hmm. and then you sign it. Well, but you use two hands to sign. Right. So you could probably put it down somewhere or prop it up and use it like that. Or someone else could hold it and point it at you uh, while you're performing sign language gestures. The next thing to develop is a device to hold the camera (laughs) (laughs) on your shoulders or something that can, can place it in front of you. Okay, that's awesome. How is that doing? You won an award for it, so I'm assuming right. it was pretty well received. Yeah, so training that model, I've just been using data on the internet of people actually performing gestures. And so currently it has around 10 gestures it can recognize because the process of adding another gesture takes a lot of data and then mm-hmm. also has to be really validated. But I'm making it a goal to continue to keeping keep adding gestures um, mm-hmm. as the months progress and when I get time. And I have the 10 kind of essential gestures and I just want to keep adding more to the library. And uh, hopefully I can collaborate with an organization for deaf people, which can help me further bring this app to more people. Yeah. What I find so interesting is that you bring sort of this infrastructure, the how to, mm-hmm. which is so cool because you you can connect with different industry experts and help them make this the ideas like come to life, which I think is such a cool skill. <laughs> Thank you. And and I hope you I mean, if you've developed five apps so far, like I can't imagine in like 20 years how many more <laughs> cool things you'll be building as well. So that's that's awesome. So it sounds like you just you kind of come up with these ideas. You read something that sparks your interest or that you care about, and then you set yourself to building it. Right. And then figuring out mm-hmm. the solution. That's very cool. I'm trying to get into your mind a little bit Mm -hmm. and figure out like what that process is like. I think um, like when I started app development, the first app I developed was a movie and TV show finder because I didn't have an actual problem I wanted to address and I wanted to develop an app which I thought could be cool and fun. But as my app development journey progressed, I wanted to focus more on solving problems in the community. Mm -hmm. So the first app I developed to solve a problem in the community was called ShopQuick. And it was during the COVID-19 pandemic where I noticed at my local grocery stores that the wait time was so long. And I had seen that there were articles that talked about how elderly people are being exposed to these diseases from having to wait in these really long lines Mm -hmm. and how that was a problem. So I decided to just target that problem and create an app which basically tells you the wait time at your local grocery store so you can visit it when the wait time is really low. And so I think noticing problems in the community is something that can be really impactful. Even if it's a small problem, it can still help a lot of people in your community. And I just love like reading articles and reading papers and things like that. So I think that's how I've been able to find problems that have not been previously targeted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of community, you seem to be passionate about solving problems within your community, but you've also relied on the machine learning community. I'm sure the the app development Mm -hmm. community to help you on your journey of getting to where you are now. Mm -hmm. Um, Would you like to share a little bit more about about the value that that community has brought to you? Yeah, I'm really grateful to the community, like, from... And when you say community, mm -hmm. like, define, because we we throw this community word around. So Mm -hmm. if you can be more specific. Right. I'm really grateful to the app development community that really got me started. Um, I'm really grateful to, like, Apple for providing the opportunity for me to meet Tim Cook, which I think really was motivating. I still remember like sitting at home during the pandemic and meeting him virtually, which was a really like amazing experience for me. And then just like I relied on the Internet so much. So I'm just really grateful to all the people who put out instructional content and videos from blogs such as like the TensorFlow blogs, which uh, have taught me a lot about AI to all the videos on YouTube, which I think it's really impactful how like I just wanted to learn something and there was so many resources provided by the community that allowed me to learn the fundamentals of app development and then AI. And 
Then after actually starting to be a research intern at Stanford, I'm really grateful to the machine learning community. They've just really helped me learn and grow. And it's been amazing to connect with so many different people from Dr. Alami, who gave me this opportunity at such a young age and has been mentoring me to people at biodesign, such as Dr. Paul Spienmeyer and Dr. Vishnu Ravi, to people in the industry, uh, such as Dr. Lee and Dr. Jongchan Park, who have all just really like helped me grow since a young age. And I'm really grateful to them. So when you say machine learning community, are you referring to like what kind? What does that look like? And like if other folks wanted to rely on the community, like where would you even find these community members? Right. So I think just contacting people and reaching out is a really great way to get involved in the community. I think it was partly because I was young and kind of oblivious that I just sent an email and really didn't expect much from it. But to my surprise, it led to such a big opportunity for me in my journey. And so I think just reaching out to people, Mm -hmm. there's like really great people in the community who are willing to just help you and take you along on the AI and machine learning journey. So I think just sending an email or reaching out to people who you kind of look up to in the community is, is a great way to get started. And then also all the resources online. So a little bit of a controversial question. You've done so much learning outside of school. Mm -hmm. You have reached out to different professors. You have found resources online. What has the value of school brought to you? Because it's almost as if like you're going to school on your own aside. Like, Mm -hmm. so is there... Is there even value in going (laughs) and going to school? Because you have this whole world like outside of it. Mm -hmm. I think that I've personally seen that some of the courses I take actually come into use in my research. Uh, I recently took a course on statistics and coincidentally, I had an abstract submission coming up for a conference and had to do some confidence intervals and some like statistics. And I saw that come directly into use. And I think for some other courses, which may not directly come into use right now in my journey, I think that as I go to college and as I go go way deeper into AI, I'll need to use a lot of math skills. And as I go deeper into healthcare, I'll probably need to use biology skills, for example. So I think that even though some courses are not directly affecting me right now. I think they will in the future. That's really good to hear. So you said like you started learning scratch at school. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to is coding being incorporated into your schooling? Um, not, not, not really, (laughs) not really, but I actually started an initiative called Learn to Code for Kids through a nonprofit I started called Aerotech. And the goal for that is to kind of get kids started on their app development journey. I just think that app development is one aspect of like STEM and tech that I think is really impactful because it can give anyone, no matter how old they are, the ability to make a difference right from their home. Uh, For me personally, I've been able to distribute apps that have been able to reach so many people. And I think it's such an important skill. So uh, through Learn to Code for Kids, for the past three years, I've been teaching app development to kids around the nation. Kids as young as elementary school, which has been really amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. So What have they made? So I take them through the basics, the very basics. But at the end, I actually have them develop a to-do list app, which is uh, really exciting. And seeing kids as young as elementary school actually develop a full app uh, is really amazing. And hopefully they can continue their app development journey after seeing that they have the ability to create an app at such a young age. You can find information about the course and how to sign up on airtech.com. And I hold the course. During, so you teach the course? I teach the course, yes. Okay, awesome. Wow. And I uh, hold the course during breaks I have. So like my winter break or my summer break. And basically uh, all the, the money for the course was $50. And that's donated to the Get Involved Foundation. Um, so and, so signing, signing up and taking the course is $50 right. from end to end. Right. Okay, Mm -hmm. And all of that is donated to the Get Involved Foundation. And the Get Involved Foundation is a foundation I've been working closely with since the start of my app development journey. They're local in Palo Alto and they help underserved communities 
to actually find community service initiatives and do like community service work. So the money that's donated there is used to help that initiative, which I'm passionate about. So anybody can go to airtech.com and there's a page where you can find the information on how to sign up and how to join the course. Is that right? Yes, anyone can join. I've had kids as young as elementary school and I've had people in college. So it's been great to see that so many people are interested in it. And, you know, when I started, there weren't as many uh, kids, but I think that as the three years that I've thought the course uh, has progressed, more people have gotten involved and I've gotten to see a lot more students over the years. And where do you teach it? Is it like fully online or is it in like a classroom somewhere? It's fully online because okay. it started during the pandemic. And I decided to keep it that way because so many students from across the nation can attend in different time zones and things like that. Oh, that's awesome. And so it's it's about an hour long where you, sort of, you instruct and show things and mm -hmm. then you give different assignments and people can play around with things sort of, you know, in between their time until the next lesson. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Very cool. All right. We will make sure to share all of the information in the show notes as well mm -hmm. um, if anybody's interested. Awesome. Thank you so much. So with this whole generative AI taking off and generative AI being able to code, mm -hmm. there is this question of whether coding is something that's going to be useful mm -hmm. long term if the computer's already going to be able to, because we're going to start interfacing with computers with natural language as opposed mm -hmm. to code. So mm -hmm. where do you see that fitting? I think that generative AI is a great tool. And I personally use it a lot nowadays to help me figure out certain coding problems. I think that as generative AI becomes better and as programmers use it more, what's going to become more important is the ability to think of ideas and actually target problems. And I think generative AI is only going to help us build solutions faster. So I think finding the problem and thinking of the solution is going to be the main component of these projects. And then the development process will probably become faster. And I think that's a good benefit and a great benefit of generative AI. So there's still value in learning to code, learning how to essentially operate a computer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in parallel with using generative AI. I think so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, so you created this nonprofit specifically, as you said, to teach students, young people how to app develop. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Like, how was that created? Um, I think that was just personally finding out how impactful app development can be. And then I know lots of kids start their coding journey with like Scratch and then they maybe go to traditional programming languages. And I feel like if I didn't discover app development, I may have not continued my journey because as I mentioned, traditional languages at a young age weren't as appealing to me and I couldn't see my code really come to life. So apps along with AI, I think these are two really impactful pieces of tech, which are also appealing to children and appealing to kids to start their journey. So seeing that lots of students start with traditional languages and also hearing at school about students calling coding boring uh, oh. kind of prompted me to start this initiative because I think app development is something that can excite anyone. You know, we use apps in our daily lives. Right. So actually having the ability to develop an app of your own can be so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. So what's next for you? So you are a junior in mm -hmm. high school. Yes. You are probably thinking about, I mean, there's an end date to high school. <laughs> so what's what's next for you? Um, I would really love to continue research. And I think I found that AI and healthcare is something I'm passionate about, uh, very passionate about, because, you know, I can develop things which can someday go along to actually help doctors and help save lives. And I think I just want to continue on that path of AI and healthcare. So I'm still debating of whether to go pre-med or whether to become a biomedical engineer, but I'm sure that I want healthcare to be a big component of what I do in the future. And I think research personally has been really exciting for me and I want to continue it. Having the opportunity to present at various conferences and seeing that the research community um, like how amazing it is and how many different ideas there are. So how are you seeing, how are your peers? <laughs> are they as brilliant as you? <laughs> like, you know, are you sort of an anomaly amongst amongst kids your age? I think um, personally in the Bay Area, I've seen that all students are like really amazing. 
one of my friends, like he's one of the top golf players uh, in the nation. So I think that there's just so many amazing people in the Bay Area and so many amazing students who are doing like different things. I know that some people I know are interested in psychology, so they've been really exploring that. And so I think it's just a matter of finding what you're interested in. And I think like what I mentioned, just like contacting people, making connections is really like applicable to anything. And uh, I think anyone at any age can really make a big difference. So I think starting early is really great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's good that you're in this environment because it sounds, you know, this, especially in the Bay Area, as you said, like you're not sort of, you're part of a group of peers that are very, very similar in, in their drive. Mm -hmm. But I can imagine that like this is also a lot of pressure. I mean, do you feel that pressure as a young person, as a student? Um, do you feel like a pressure of, you know, of looking around at your other peers and feeling, oh, I got to do something extra? I mean, from what it sounds to me, like on your journey, it really sounds like you're just like curious and you're like, oh, this is interesting. Let me solve this. But is there an element as well to, to sort of, you know, you like it's like you're kind of caught in the wheel and you like you have to keep going? Um, I think everyone's on their own path. So I don't think that there's any pressure from peers. And I think like I think we all just support each other on our own like paths, whether it's like athletics, whether it's um, app development, whether it's psychology. I think everyone's just on their own paths and it's just up to what you're interested in. Like if someday you find out that you don't want to continue on this journey and you don't have interest in it, in it anymore. I think it's good that you're still a kid and you're still figuring out things. And I think you should just like explore lots of different things and find out what you really love to do. Great answer. Good answer. Okay. I have, I have one last question for you. <laughs> what is like a moonshot for you? Like if you could do accomplish like you've the world's your oyster now you can kind of build and create anything is there is there like a challenge that you're like this is my next big big challenge that I want to I want to go after I think it's getting my first like medical AI algorithm FDA cleared I think that's a milestone that I'm really really hope that someday I can accomplish and I know that from there it can go and reach a lot of people and that's what I really want to do so I think that's been kind of a goal that I've put for myself. I'm so excited that you came in today and that you shared all this amazing work. And I'm really, really excited to continue following your journey. And I hope that it becomes a reality. Thank you so much for having me on Thanks the podcast. For coming. If you would like to learn more about our conversation or our guests, check out the links below. Please subscribe. And if you're feeling extra generous, give us a five-star rating. We would love, love to hear from you. So leave us a comment. We'll read everyone. Until next time. Thank you for listening.